Welcome everyone. I am your host, Dr. Felicia J. Lindsay, founder of AGR Book Club. Welcome to Deliciously Lit, the podcast where adventure, books, and cuisine collide. If this is your first time to our channel, or if you've been here before, say hello. I'm back. Delit. Now, pour yourself a glass of your favorite beverage, settle in, and get ready for some deliciously lit fun. Hello, I'm your host, Dr. Felicia J. Lindsay. I am here today with Casey Rogers an awesome author. She is the author of The Color of Frost, but she has a long history of writing and just a colorful and diverse history as far as her career. Casey, tell us more about your career. Oh, thank you so much. I'd be happy to. You're absolutely right. I've had a very diverse career. (laughs) I started out when I graduated from high school in theater and decided poverty wasn't for me. So I I took more work in the film industry. There was a a company that I used to work for in the Boston area called Film Arts. And they actually were the place where Spencer for Hire and Murder, She Wrote was produced. That is Um, awesome. Yeah. So after that, I moved down to New York City. But at the same time, I was working for an ad agency. It was not an ad agency. I'm sorry. It was a production company. And we did animation. It was a consortium. And Matt Gronick was like, we had signed him, you know, he was the creator of The Simpsons. And we used to do The Simpsons commercials with Bart Simpson and Butterfinger. (laughs) I yeah. love the Simpsons. Yeah, yeah, he's he's so talented. But anyway, like while I was doing all of that, I was also writing because that was my passion because I figured if I couldn't be on the stage, I could play all the characters in my head. So mm-hmm. I started writing a musical and I worked on that for a really, really long time. But At that point in my life, Mm -hmm. there were very, very few women in theater that did what I did because I, or as a matter of fact, I'm not even sure if anybody really did what I do. Mm -hmm. I wrote the book. I wrote the music and the lyrics. And I actually had a lot of people, you know, I was kind of going up the chain in terms Mm -hmm. of you know, we did a a number of workshops. I had a lot of very, very high power, you know, Broadway producers looking Mm -hmm. at the work. And I just absolutely loved it. I love writing music. I love, you know, the, the whole idea of the stage, Mm -hmm. but as time went on, mother nature was calling and I wanted to start a family (laughs) And mm-hmm. so as I was approaching my 40s, I, you know, said to my husband, it's now or never. And so we decided to have children and I had boy girl twins oh. at age 42. <laughs> so I can identify. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Not um, with twins, but at 40. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. It gives you a different perspective on child rearing. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like I was not ready before and I I have the most wonderful children. I'm so happy that things happened the way that they did. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're just stellar human beings. They just, you know, delight me every single day. So I'm very, very fortunate that it did happen the way it did. But I had to step back from my career because Mm -hmm. at that time I was commuting into Manhattan two and a half hours each way. So Mm -hmm. five hours of my day was just spent traveling. That's a lot. It is. It is a lot. And I ended up leaving my job for an ad agency I was working for 
one of the largest ad agencies in the world, J. Walter Thompson. Wow. And, you know, I took some time off to be a mom. Mm -hmm. And then years later, my husband at the time, he was a copywriter and he was working for an ad agency that consolidated. So when they all started consolidating, lots of people lost their jobs. And he was among one of the last to go, but he did lose his job. Mm -hmm. And he had always wanted to move to Canada because we had had a a vacation property up there. Mm -hmm. And he was French Canadian. And he was like, you know, it would be easier on us in a lot of ways because, you know, they had universal health care. They still you know, he, he wanted the children to go to a parochial school and they paid for parochial schools up there. So there were a lot of reasons why we decided to do it. Mm -hmm. And when we got up there, we opened up a restaurant called the two beans cafe after Mm -hmm. my children who we call the two beans. beans. I love it. Yeah. So it was called the two beans cafe and tea room. And my husband took a job back in the States Mm -hmm. months after we moved up there. So it was kind of a very tumultuous period because Mm -hmm. I was left to raise the children and start a new business. Mm -hmm. But I really thrived because I love cooking. So I always think of cooking and I know it sounds like a stretch, but cooking and film relate a lot. Because when you're cooking, it's it's like a production. I mm-hmm. felt like every time I made a meal, I had this mini production going on. And everything had to be plated beautifully and presented to the, you know, to the customer in a certain way. Sure. So that they felt very, very special and engaged when they were eating the meal. So it was such a lovely way for me to continue doing things that I absolutely love doing. However, I wasn't, you know, like commuting into New York anymore. I actually mm-hmm. lived upstairs above the restaurant. Now so, that was nice. Yeah, it was, it was lovely. And I made so many good friends and I had, such a wonderful, strong community of people that Mm -hmm. just really cared. And I did a lot of artistic work up there. Mm -hmm. We did spoken word and, you know, like I held different events, like I would do Victorian teas. Oh, that's so fun. Costumes and, you know, we would read Dickens. And so it was, it was almost like my little theater, even though it wasn't. You had a theater group. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it was a really wonderful and very, very positive experience for me. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, about three years, four, maybe four years after I moved up there, you know, things got really rocky because my husband was never there. Mm -hmm. And I started to kind of realize that my relationship wasn't always what I thought it was. And that is really the subject of a memoir I wrote called Our Better Selves. Mm -hmm. And but I didn't write that until almost 10 years after he had passed away. And I wrote it as a way to kind of untangle all of the things that happened between the two of us Mm -hmm. in our marriage and coming to the realization that throughout our marriage, he had really financially abused me. And there was a lot of emotional abuse, never any physical abuse, Mm -hmm. but a lot of gaslighting and things that until you step back, Mm -hmm. it's very, very hard to recognize But in the absence of him being there every single day, I realized how much better I felt about myself as a human being because he wasn't there to berate me every day. Mm -hmm. 
so when I went back, he kind of manipulated it. So I needed to return to the States Mm -hmm. and I went back with the intention of divorcing him, but that was really hard to do because he had manipulated things for about, I would say almost nine months where he wouldn't pay any bills he had run up our credit card debt. He was, wor- you know, he was working his butt off, but he opened up a bank account under his own name. So I had no access to any money. I was driving around in a car that didn't have a working instrument panel. So I never knew if I had gas in the car. And he basically forced me to drain my resources so mm-hmm. that when I got back there, I was completely dependent on him financially. Mm-hmm. And he wouldn't even, you know, he wouldn't give me money for groceries without expecting a receipt so I could show him what I spent or gas mm-hmm. money. Mm-hmm. So about six Many months, women can identify with your story. Yes. Yes. And that's why I wrote about it because writing a memoir is like bearing your soul. You're mm-hmm. opening yourself up to a lot of criticism, but I felt like it was an important story because I had been working in a career where I made well over a six figure income mm-hmm. and, you know, I had a lot of stability mm-hmm. and I basically my job allowed him to have his career because he was a freelancer before we had children Mm -hmm. and he could take a job or he could refuse the job and he didn't have to commute, you know, like every single day he had to commute when he was working in the city, Mm -hmm. but it was my job that paid for the health insurance. It was my job that paid for the mortgage and all the other things where he kind of reinvested most of the income he made into his business. So I went back with the intention of leaving the marriage and it was very difficult because again, I had no financial resources anymore. And this always coming like unraveling during the recession that we had back in the like, you know, 2008, 2009, that era. So it was really hard just to even find a job. And about six months after I moved down there, we found out that he was dying of cancer. He actually had esophageal cancer. Mm -hmm. And when it was finally diagnosed, we learned that they said that he had like two weeks to live. So he did Mm -hmm. laugh for about six months. But after that, the trauma that I had experienced Mm -hmm. really only started to heal after I started writing about this memoir, that I I was able to piece together things that I'd never pieced together before. I never realized the impact of some of the things that had happened early on in our relationship. Mm -hmm. And how it impacted the way that we move forward in our lives. Mm -hmm. So that empowered me. Writing that memoir empowered me to tackle a book of fiction. Okay. (laughs) I was like, hey, listen, if I could put down in writing a true Mm -hmm. story And it's very, it's a very compelling read because it, you know, like, because I have training, I have a master's degree in creative writing. I've always written. I really used all of the things that I knew about writing, all of the tools in my toolbox to create a very compelling narrative because memoirs are really for the reader there. I mean, yes, it did help me as a writer in terms of helping me to break free from some of those things that I had experienced, Mm -hmm. but the goal of it was to reach other women that had experienced what I experienced 
and be able to identify it in their lives. So I figured, okay, I've written a memoir and I decided to write The Color of Frost. Now, when did you start the initiative? I started the initiative or the idea for the initiative Mm -hmm. about a year ago. And it was in some ways a reflection of The Color of Frost because in at the very end of that story like that story was born out of my desire to express to my twins this is the world i want you to live in this mm-hmm. is the world that i want you to understand the impacts of the actions that so many people take and how if I were to give you a roadmap, I would want you to take away these important messages from mm-hmm. the life of the main character and what she experienced and how she went and rose above her own internal conflicts. Tell us a little bit about The Color of Frost. The Color of Frost takes place in 1974. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did that was because 1974 has a lot of similarities to what we're experiencing right now. We had Nixon leaving the White House. We had high inflation. We had high gas prices. Mm -hmm. Women we're still at that point. A woman couldn't walk into a bank and get a credit card. A woman had to have a co-signer on a mortgage. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of obstacles for women at that point. Educational opportunities were only becoming available, higher education, because of the Vietnam War. And you know, they were trying to fill the seats at universities, but most of the young men were over fighting a war. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of reasons why I said it in this time period. So I could give the reader an opportunity to look back to see how far we came and see where we are now in this moment in time and some of the obstacles that we still face, but looking at it almost backwards. Okay, this is where we were in 1974. Where are we now? And what got us to this point? And and the story is really about community mm-hmm. and about putting forward a... I know it sounds very high-minded, but it's a message of love and embracing diversity and equality for all people. Mm -hmm. And my main character is an adopted woman who was adopted when she was quite young, you know, just an infant, into an Italian family. Mm -hmm. And that was very rare because back in those days, that was like really considered taboo. You didn't Mm -hmm. adopt children. And she has experienced so much trauma in her life. So where she starts off and her, like the arc of her character Mm -hmm. really changes over the course of the book to the very end of it. And the end of the book, the, the epilogue is really what caused me to say, I've, I not only have to write about this, I have to do about it Mm -hmm. because it is almost like it's almost like a blueprint for what I feel we need to do in terms of tackling the abuse that so many women experience. Mm -hmm. And she, in the book, started a uh, foundation called Safe Harbor. And it was a foundation or resource to shelter abused women. But what she realized was that we can have 
shelter after shelter after shelter. Mm -hmm. But until we deal with the systemic reasons why abuse occurs and why, especially during the pandemic, it increased exponentially worldwide, mm -hmm. had so much to do with women's economic capabilities and mm -hmm. how much they had that safety net so that they could leave a toxic relationship. And when I started doing research for The Color of Frost, I was like, holy catfish, there are just so many reasons why women are always stymied in terms of equality. Mm -hmm. Like one thing is the gender wage gap. Another thing is the pink tax, where women are paying taxes on products that men don't have to, or the prices are just so much higher. Yeah. Um, and, and that takes away from women's purchasing power. If they have less purchasing power, they have less money to invest. Mm -hmm. And this, there were a couple of statistics that just blew me away. Like one of them is that in 2022, non-custodial parents were in arrears $118 billion in arrears wow. mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, like this is money that women need to raise their children, but they don't have it. Yes. So they're struggling the way I was struggling, if they want to leave an abusive relationship, I had no resources financially. Mm -hmm. Another thing that was- and A lot of people don't have community. Right. That they can reach out to, to help them. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's, I love the fact that you bring that up because community is really what saves my main character. Mm -hmm. She forms this little community, you know, she doesn't do it even intentionally, but the way that the story unfolds and it, it's really what saves her and what gives her the impetus to do what she does eventually to try to make a difference in the world. Yeah. So, now, the, the yeah. other thing I like is how you develop the character and you really show depression. Yes. When I was reading it, you could feel it. You already identified with the character. You really developed her, but you could feel how depressed she was. You could see in her past how she had struggled with depression and how the situation was spiraling her back into a mm -hmm. depression. So mm -hmm. that was that was really enlightening to see that and for other people to be able to see and identify. Yeah. I really struggled with that because I, when my husband passed away, he left us totally penniless. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and on top of that, I had medical debt. On top of that, I had credit card debt. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really hard. I was married for 25 years. So it's not like, you know, it was... I, I, it doesn't matter how long you're married. It, it has an impact when you experience yes, these things, but it left me with just this overwhelming feeling mm -hmm. that nothing was ever going to get better. And I can look back on those days now mm -hmm. and not laugh about them, but I could say, you know, Oh my, <laughs> because Every there were so many things that happened. Mm -hmm. Like he was somebody stole his social security number and filed our tax returns on his behalf and got a refund. Yeah. 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 So he went through identity theft after he died. Mm -hmm. So it took me years to be able to deal with that and get our refund. And then I had the place in Canada. I was like back living in Massachusetts. So I had no working vehicle. So, you know, I had all these obstacles. 
But mm-hmm. just like the main character in The Color of Frost had all of these things that weighed on her, mm-hmm. it was the sense of community that really started to make her feel stronger and unify with other people that had the same beliefs. And it really set her on a different path in life. And that's what I wanted to show my kids. I I wanted it to be authentic Mm -hmm. so that if somebody that suffers from depression, and I do mean suffer, that Mm -hmm. like clinical depression it's real. It's not just about snap out of it, you know. Nope. Yeah, snap out of it. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's something that people battle with all the time. Like I I kind of read a lot about people like William Styron, who, you know, was a, such a brilliant writer, but mm-hmm. he succumbed to depression, you know, and he committed suicide. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to capture that feeling of hopelessness to provide the reader with a backdrop of there's hopelessness and there's hope. And how do you go from one to the next? And you really need that sense of community to Mm -hmm. give you that connection. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So the book gives you a plan, but you've also started the initiative that people can get in contact with to be able to get out of those relationships yes the whole goal of the initiative is to provide information the warning signs Mm -hmm. trying to put forward the connections so that people see 99 percent of all women that are in domestically abusive relationships are also being financially abused because it's a way for the abuser to maintain power and control over them. If they have no resources to leave, then it makes them, you know, vulnerable and all these barriers are put up to leaving the relationship. And the initiative, the goal is almost like, there's almost like three points. Mm -hmm. One is to provide women with the resources to know how to identify it, what to do about it, where to go. But also it's about prevention because the thing that keeps so many women in these relationships is not having financial equality and we earn like so much less than men do for the same work it's it there are so like on the website for the initiative i have diagrams about all the different things that play into this one subject Mm -hmm. and it reinforces how women continue like John F. Kennedy signed the equal pay check act or equal pay act, excuse me, in Mm -hmm. 1963. So it's 60 years ago and we're still fighting for, yeah, financial equality. And, and that really prohibits us from, having power and influence over our life, especially in a time where we as a country, money influences politics in so many ways. When the very wealthiest are able to make all of these donations or have super PACs or or even the dark money, they can influence politics Mm-hmm. in a way that we can't because we don't have those resources. So that's why The Color of Frost to me, even though it's it's a very compelling story, and again, I used all the arsenals in my writer's toolbox to craft a narrative that has a lot of hidden meaning, but at the same time, it's a good story. 
You know, it's a really good story because at yeah. first when I started reading, I was like, okay, historical fiction. But I will be honest with you, I do read a lot of historical fiction. Mm -hmm. But I liked how basically like how you did it. It's everything that's going on in her life, I can identify with now in 2023. Yes. So it wasn't it wasn't like everything was based on all the historical facts that was going on. There were some things that were thrown in so that you can understand the time period and what was going on. Mm -hmm. But the premise behind the story, you could identify with her. Yes. There's people who have went through divorce. There's people who have lost their homes in a divorce. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, so it was, everybody could identify with it. I really mm -hmm. enjoyed it. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, it, you know, and and I had to make her a chef <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I I believe that food in so many ways is a very healing thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a way to give of yourself without, I, I don't even know how to, I just love it. I just, I love being able to give people that part of myself mm -hmm. by crafting things that are yummy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And in, in the very beginning of the book, like I have her making my absolute favorite meal. Uh -huh. So, so she could, I could almost relive, you know, like what she was experiencing in, in that particular chapter. So I had her having an exquisite bottle of Bordeaux mm -hmm. and she was making salt and buca, which I just absolutely love. And like I love roasting asparagus. I must have it at least once or twice a week when it's when it's available. So and the dessert she had my favorite dessert in the world, tiramisu. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I never had that dish before, but <gasps> just reading and the sautéing, I was yes. like, oh my gosh, I want to have some of that. Yeah. And I've all yeah. I love wine, so of course yes. I wanted to do that. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> Me too. And and the interesting thing is, is that I did that a lot with my memoir because I mm -hmm. used a lot of the recipes or the concepts because I'm, I'm a chef, but I'm not, you know, it's like, I'm not one of these people that I'll, I look at recipes more as suggestions, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. I'll read a recipe and it's like, okay, I kind of got this and then I'll go off and do my own thing. <laughs> You know what tastes good together. You know the yeah. flavor profile. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So in the in my memoir, you know, I use both books to kind of reflect some of my personal picadillos. <laughs> it's like cooking means a lot to me. That mm -hmm. that ability to share and mm -hmm. to show other people, or you know like a younger person, how to do, a, you know, certain things. Yes. So those, there are a lot of common threads between mm -hmm. both works. And also, you know, Nina herself, the main character, experiences some of the things that I experienced, you know, like feeling displaced, no longer having the security of a marriage, because even though things were tumultuous, there's the little things of, you know, people would invite me out, you know, to like a Christmas party or something. I didn't know how to go by myself anymore. Mm -hmm. And you've feel, been married for 20 odd so years. Yes, yeah. You start to form your identity with that person. Yeah. And around your life. So yeah. it's hard. You had to change and step out and be more independent and go out on your own. It's yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are a lot of like common threads between both works, but the color of frost and the ending really made me realize that I can't just write about it. I had to do it. So I, I've been working with, Actually, it was the woman that designed the book cover for The Color of Frost. Beautiful book. 
Oh, thank you. Thank you. She did. She, that was all her. That was all Kat, who is a writer as well. She and I have been working to basically create a website that's very cohesive and it shows my, you know, like my writing, but also the initiative, which we called I Know Why She Stayed, because I didn't understand why women stayed in abusive relationships mm -hmm. until I was in an abusive relationship. And I always thought of abuse in terms of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Physical. Mm -hmm. Right. When I, as a matter of fact, I created like a little video on there and it was about my concept of abuse was tied to a neighbor that we had when I was 12, my parents had moved us from Massachusetts to upstate New York and we were living in a duplex apartment mm -hmm. and the man or the family next to us, it was like a husband and wife and five children. And one, one night, like I thought that the sounds that we were hearing were his kids roughhousing because they had four boys and one girl. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it was him beating his wife. He was throwing her against the wall. Mm -hmm. And my mother was like, you know, doc, you have to do something about this. And my father was like, it's not, it's none of our business. It's none of our business. And I just kept on thinking, why doesn't she just leave? Why doesn't she take her five children and just get out of there? Mm -hmm. What I wasn't considering, okay, I was only 12, but she was this petite Korean woman who like barely spoke the language. Mm -hmm. He'd mm -hmm. never worked in her life. He controlled every aspect of her life. And mm -hmm. she had five children all under the age of 10. Where And this was at a time that there were very few shelters or resources um, that she could have tapped into. Mm -hmm. Where was she to go? But in my mind, I kept on saying, you know, why doesn't she just go? And that was a question a lot of people asked me. If your marriage was so bad, why didn't you just leave your husband? How was I going to leave him? I had two children. And no financial resources, no economic prospects. And, you know, like I, I wasn't about to take my children and be homeless. Yes. So those resources in place. Right. Yeah. And that's why I called it. I know why she stayed because it wasn't until I experienced what Mrs. White experienced that I finally got it. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that a lot of people don't understand is the trauma of abuse. I was traumatized. I went from being a very, very outgoing, confident woman to being somebody that was afraid of their own shadow because I was constantly berated. You know, it like nothing I did was good enough. And this was always, you know, he never said anything in front of anybody else. As a matter of fact, he used to praise me all the time in front of other people. But when we were behind closed doors or alone, it was, you know, he made me feel worthless. You know, he, he made claims about our past that were just so unfounded, you know, that gaslighting. Mm -hmm. And the trauma that you experience really takes such a long time to heal and women are trying to leave a relationship when they they have you know the fog of trauma they're dealing with life issues so the whole idea of i know why she stayed is trying to get people to understand that if you have somebody in your life mm -hmm you suspect is being financially abused or abused in any way, try to put yourself in their place. Like a lot of 
you know, it's very easy to say, well, I wouldn't put up with that. And that's basically what I did for years. Mm -hmm. I never be the victim of abuse because I'm too smart and I make too much money. And, you know, people can be so judgmental. And Mm -hmm. I was, Mm -hmm. and I was until I was there until I realized that I was a victim. I couldn't even use the word abuse. When I started writing the memoir, I called it dysfunction. I was in a dysfunctional marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the initiative to me is the next step. I still plan on writing things. (laughs) I I have another memoir, I mean, not a a memoir, but another work of fiction, kind of like a first draft. Mm -hmm. But it's where my heart and soul is. And I do it for my kids. I do it because I want them, especially because I have boy girl twins Mm -hmm. and I see the differences. I see the narratives that are out there and I want to help them change the world so that they have, you know, they, they have equal opportunities. Now, if people want to get more information about your initiative, where would they go? Uh, they can go to my website. It's Casey with a K, K A S E Y Rogers, no D R O G E R S dot com. We also took out the URL for I know why she stayed dot org. And I think we took out, but I don't know if it's linked. I K W S S. <laughs> but, but yeah, there's a, there's, a tab on my personal website where I sell my mm-hmm. books mm-hmm. and, you know, like there's like, you know, some merch and stuff like that right on there. And, and it really, and one of the things that your listeners, if they're so inclined, if they want to contribute to writing a story mm-hmm. about what, you know, economic instability has had in their lives, whether they were financially abused or just had difficulty, you know, due to other circumstances, a death, you know, a divorce, whatever. We're trying to have people understand the impact of the dollar on human lives and, and, so there's a form on there that you can write your own story and tell us. And eventually what we're going to do, because this summer I'm going to Europe and I'm doing a little book tour and mm-hmm. we're going to, you know, be sending out postcards to people that contribute stories mm-hmm. so that they get a postcard from Paris. <laughs> so, so they yeah. can follow you along your journey of the book tour. Yes, exactly. That would be awesome. That would be yeah. awesome. Yeah. And you also have a podcast where yeah. people can see on Apple and Spotify. Yeah, yeah. It's the Emerging Writer series, and I have fifteen episodes up there. And I hope and I hope to relaunch it this summer. I kind of took a break when I was trying to finish up the Color of Frost. But it's up there, and I think it's a really good series to Mm -hmm. show writers how they can handle the business of writing. Because the one thing that's really difficult Mm -hmm. is that even if you're published by, you know, like a major publisher, you once they're kind of like promotional stuff, ends you have to be a you know like a marketing social media person to push your work so I have like I said 15 interviews up there with some stellar writers Mm -hmm. that offer different types of advice I'm going to be doing a thing on there's a, a virtual conference called Write Hive, right as in W R I T E Hive in June. It's the first week of June. And 
you know, so I interview people like those that organized Right Hive, which is growing tremendously. So you can, and, and I have like an events page. So if somebody wants to see me in person, I'm, I'm going to be in Kittery, Maine tonight, <laughs> speaking at the Rice Library. So, you know, you can follow what I'm doing on my website. Now, in Maine, you say you're going to Kittering, Maine. What is yep. your favorite restaurant there? I've never been to Kittering, Maine. Oh, well, I what is your favorite restaurant where you are? <laughs> but I'll <laughs> tell you about my favorite restaurant about where I live, though. Okay. I, I did. The main character in my book lives in Kittering, Maine. Uh -huh. But I did, I selected that more for the metaphor it gives me because it was right on the ocean. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of like metaphor for waves and, you know, the bounty of the sea and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I live in the Berkshires in Massachusetts okay. and I'm in Western Massachusetts in a little town called North Adams and North Adams has a lovely restaurant that's actually owned by a woman that I consider a dear friend. Her name is Colleen Taylor and she owns three or four restaurants in the area. And my favorite place just to hang out is called the freight yard pub. Mm -hmm. And she does a wonderful job. It's just like great pub food, you know, like great burgers, great fries, great drinks. Mm -hmm. wonderful wine, <laughs> a huge selection of beer. And I just love it. Like whenever the kids and I decide to go out, we have a lot of restaurants in the area, but I always end up at one that Colleen owns. <laughs> so It's just a good restaurant. Yeah. Now, my next question is, what would you pair as far as a drink and a dish? Because you know we always pair a drink and a dish with every book. What would you pair with the color of frost? Well, since I wrote about the salt and Buddha <laughs> from the very beginning, uh -huh. and it's my favorite meal. <laughs> And I have a lovely Chateau La Duguay. <laughs> I might as well promote that because, again, it's a wonderful Bordeaux. It's probably a lot more expensive right now than it would have been back in 1974. <laughs> but I just love the combination of salt and buca. The, in Italian, it means, I think, jump jump in your mouth or something. Ooh. It's just a great, again, it's a metaphor for how I feel about food and, and that it can be, it can be so soothing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just, I just love it. <laughs> so, and that's what I would do. I would pair that dish with that wine, just like I did in the book. <laughs> but that sounds like a great pairing. And yeah. you can also see more about Casey Rogers on the website, which is www.agr book club. She will be featured in her book. So make sure you pick up a copy and read more about this story. You will enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us tonight. Oh, you're very, very welcome. You have a good day. You too.